last of this lecture series for the year. Um, so those of you who have been coming regularly, that's awesome. I'm so glad that you've made it out to so many of these. Um, and the new faces we have, really glad that we, that we got you into this. Um, we will probably continue this next year. We may take January off, um, but definitely stay tuned to the email lists uh, to get updates like that. Uh, we are a part of Back to the Bays, um, which is part of Cornell Cooperative Extension Marine Program. Um, and what we do is restoration for habitats, species. You're going to hear about a lot of amazing species today in the fish um, department. So I'm really excited for the topic today. Uh, and if any of you are interested in volunteering with us for any of our events, we had some of you here with Celebration this last weekend out in Greenport, which was really helpful. Um, I'm the volunteer coordinator for Back to the Bays. So come talk to me, sign up on our email list, which is right up here. Uh, and if you're really interested in volunteering, mark that down on the list so that I can put you on our, on our special email list. Um, in the spring, we do things with horseshoe crabs. Uh, throughout the summer, seahorses, um, eelgrass, beach grass, coastal plants of all sorts, as well as the shellfish. Um, scallops, oysters, mussels even, and clams. Um, so today I'm going to introduce you to Kristen Gerbino, who is part of our fisheries department. She's a fisheries specialist and she's going to tell us all about uh, sustainable fishing. So, thanks. Hi everybody. Thank you so much for coming tonight. If you can't hear, come close. Um, it's a nice small audience so I can really um, get to know you guys and hear all your questions and um, you'll leave here eating lots of local fish, hopefully. So, thanks for having me. Okay, so um, I'm a fishery specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extensions Marine Program, and in the fisheries department, we've gotten involved with a lot of different projects. Um, we are fully grant funded, so basically whatever we can think of, we can do, right? And it was a lot of different research projects um, with the commercial and, and recreational fishermen, um, focusing on uh, different ways to uh, modify and adapt gear to uh, fishing gear to maybe reduce bycatch and cleaning up Long Island Sound of derelict lobster pots and you name it. Uh, we've done a lot of different research, but what we really realized that we needed was more promotion and marketing of local seafood on Long Island. Um, so many fishermen out there landing beautiful, fresh, delicious fish yet we're not fully utilizing that fish. Um, and a lot of people just don't know a lot about it. So that's why I'm here tonight. Uh, we did start our Choose Local Fish initiative. FISH is an acronym for Fresh, Indigenous, Sustainable, and Healthy. And uh, our Choose Local Fish initiative is aimed at increasing awareness, interest, and demand for locally harvested fish and shellfish on Long Island. We're, we're doing this to basically challenge seafood imports, which so much of the seafood that we eat in the United States is imported from other countries, yet we're not fully utilizing the fish that we have right along our coast and in our waters. So we are trying to make the most of that through education and outreach, like these type of events. New York's uh, commercial fishing industry, which is what we focus on, is a very valuable industry here on Long Island. Um, 26.6 million pounds of fish are landed here with a value of 37.4 million dollars. So if you take into consideration all the un other industries surrounding commercial fishing industry including harvesting, culturing, processing, preserving, restaurants, transporting, marketing, selling, if you take that into consideration along with the fishermen, the wholesalers, retailers, shippers, gear, suppliers, repair, and uh, fisheries managers, and restaurants. That is a very big industry, uh, $168 million value to that industry. So on Long Island, uh, in New York State, we have 904 uh, New York State food fish license holders. We also have some other permits uh, that fishermen possess in New York State, but for the most part, that a lot of our commercial fishermen on Long Island hold food fish holder permits. And 201 vessels with federal permits um, listing New York as their principal port. So you can get an idea about how many fishing vessels we have on Long Island. The types of gear that the fishermen use on Long Island are primarily um, 
trawlers or draggers, same thing, gill nets, pots and traps, which fish for a fish, crabs, lobsters, and other, other things like that, um, rod and reel or hook and line, which we have our director of our marine program, Chris Pickrell here with a, a rod and reel. He went out with us on a striped bass fishing trip that we went on recently. And pound trap, which is this pretty interesting looking contraption here, which the fish are funneled into here. And long line, which catch a lot of tile fish and dredges. So which species are local to Long Island, which is a question I get all the time. Um, and we have a poster here. I think you guys have checked it out, but it has 48 edible fish, shellfish, and crustacean species that are um, local to our region. And some people are surprised by all of them, and especially the ones that come up from the south when the weather is warm, uh, such as mahi-mahi. A lot of people say, wow, I can't believe we have mahi-mahi here. And yes, we do in the summertime and fall. Um, there are over 100 different species of fish in total that are landed in New York. Not all of them are edible, but um, it's quite a lot. And some of them are available all year round. Some of them are only available during certain seasons. So it's important to take that into consideration when you're thinking about what fish that you're looking to purchase or eat in a, in a restaurant or a fish market. Okay, so I'd like to ask this question to the audience you can look at it if you want, but what fish do you think uh, New York is most well known for? What are the fish that you would, off the top of your head, think, oh, okay, that fish has landed in a high quantity in New York? I mean, do you guys have any ideas of what you would say? What, what would you think? Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's great that you guys know some of the fish that are local to the area. Um, people are surprised to know that the species that is most, that is landed in the highest quantity in New York State is a squid, longfin squid. Yeah, so we have a very big squid fishery. Uh, in, number two is porgies or scup, that's the same thing. Um, menhaden, which is not a edible fish. Clams, tilefish. We have a very big tilefish fishery in Montauk. Yet that's not a fish that we really know too much about or see often in fish markets or, or fully utilize. Fluke or summer flounder, same thing. Um, monkfish is another big one. Whiting, skate, black sea bass, um, dogfish, bluefish, blackfish, striped bass. I'm sure some of these you guys are familiar with, but some of them are probably a surprise as far as the amount of fish of this species that's being landed in New York. So that is in stark contrast to what we, what Americans eat as far as the seafood um, that's consumed in the United States. It's very different. Um, so you can see here, what types of seafoods are Americans eating? So number one is shrimp, number two is salmon. That's no surprise, you see that on every restaurant menu. But they are not local to this area. Um, this is, the data is a little, you know, the data is what it is. It's a little skewed because in New York, you know, we're a coastal state, so we do have access to more local seafood, uh, more seafood in general, but um, it is pretty interesting that what people are eating is nowhere near what we're, um, what is coming across our docks on Long Island. So per capita, Americans eat about 19 pounds of seafood a year per person, which is which has gone down slightly since the year before. In, um, this is in 2020, uh, per capita, we've eaten 19 pounds of seafood. It's gone down since 2019. Um, the pandemic has definitely skewed those numbers a little bit. But like I said, shrimp topped the list and has actually hit a record of five pounds per capita of, um, in, 2000, in 2020. Salmon is down slightly, but still in second place, and canned tuna is in third. So the pandemic has disrupted um, some of our seafood operations and businesses, but no doubt. But um, you know, with restaurant closures, there hasn't been that many opportunities for people to consume seafood. But it has been um, the purchases at retail, especially the frozen market, has definitely um, ticked up in that in that direction. So. 
Um, there are more people eating seafood than it shows in this uh, figure, but Okay, so one of the big reasons that we're doing this project is because we want to um, make people realize that at least 79% of the seafood consumed in the U.S. is imported from overseas, um, while so much of the seafood that is landed in New York is exported to other countries. So we're not fully utilizing all the fish that we have here. Um, overseas imports, the problem with that is that they are more likely to be unregulated and mislabeled uh, according to environmental and social regulations. So basically we do not know the standards that they must adhere to to provide that seafood to you, <coughs> which is problematic. And the imported species compete unfairly with our local seafood and that deprice, depresses the price and the value um, resulting in price stagnation for locally harvested seafood. Local seafood has a much smaller carbon footprint. It, it can be landed at the dock one morning and be on your plate at a restaurant the, that evening. So you know, there's a lot of um, environmental benefits to that as well as freshness. Um, so you could see that <clears throat> there is a benefit to local when it comes to reducing carbon footprint. Does not take a long time to travel to you. Does not take as much you know, trucking and handling and that type of thing. Um, on average, seafood um, must pass through 15 people's hands before it gets to your plate. So by choosing local, you're definitely reducing the number of hands that, <clears throat> that that seafood passes through. And on Long Island, we have a very strong local food movement. So um, there's a range of seafood products that are available here and harvested directly from our water. So we hope that you find value in that and take advantage of that. The benefits of choosing local fish, there's a lot of them. Um, by choosing local fish, you're supporting the economic viability of the fishermen, your coastal communities here on the North Fork and small businesses, and boosting the economic value of New York seafood industry. Um, all U.S. seafood, in, especially local seafood, is sustainably harvested and in compliance with very strict U.S. and state regulations, which is very important. Um, Choosing local enables the consumer to know the direct origin of their food. So a lot of the fish markets that you go to, especially on the North Fork, can explain to you exactly where a lot of the fish came from that you might be interested in purchasing. Since that seafood doesn't take so long to get to your uh, plate from the dock and from the ocean or bay or sound, um, is fresher and higher quality. And then it also reduces the environmental impact of food production, which I'll get to next, which I find very important. <clears throat> and it also preserves the heritage of Long Island's farming and fishing communities. Okay, so environmental benefits of choosing local seafood. This is something that I feel like once people learn about, <clears throat> it's definitely a light bulb goes off and they realize, wow, that, that, does, make a, that does make a lot of sense when you're thinking of seafood as opposed to uh, like chicken and beef and stuff like that. <clears throat> Excuse me, but harvesting seafood has a lower environmental impact than industrial agriculture, since approximately 70% of fresh water consumption worldwide goes towards uh, raising crops and livestock, <clears throat> and the meat industry produces significant greenhouse gases. Compared to land-based protein, um, choosing seafood reduces the strain on the environment because when we're thinking about raising chicken or beef, we need to make sure there's enough land and space and food and water to raise the cattle or chickens. But with fish, they're out there living their best life, swimming around in the water right now. They're not requiring any additional you know, water from us or space or food from us. So that is definitely a benefit. <clears throat> fish are free ranging all the time. And like I said, they're, take, they're definitely um, a lower carbon footprint to reach your plate. So that's kind of, to me, um, definitely a benefit when you think about raising chickens and beef as opposed to seafood that's swimming around in the environment right now. Okay, health benefits of seafood. I know you guys hear this all the time, but the current advice from health organizations is to eat two seafood meals per week. Um, for the many good reasons. So seafood is a very nutrient-dense, lean source of protein 
and it is definitely part of a healthy diet. Um, fish and shellfish are easily digestible, high quality protein with good source of vitamins and minerals, specifically B, uh, the B vitamins, selenium, vitamin D, vitamin A. So seafood are actually more nutrient dense than other types of animal protein, such as chicken and beef. And studies have shown that seafood consumption decreases the risk of cardiovascular disease and type two diabetes, as well as significantly improving child development and overall health of pregnant women and children. And a question that I get asked all the time is, well, what about mercury, right? So um, mercury is only an issue in certain fish, uh, mostly sharks, swordfish, king mackerel, tilefish. So in any other cases, the benefits of eating seafood definitely outweigh the risk. And mercury is not an issue in all seafood. And also, um, scientists are still studying the the relationship between the um, fat in seafood and the omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA, in preventing a lot of chronic illnesses. So there's a lot of great reasons to add seafood into your diet. Okay, so a lot of times we do these type of outreach and education events and people tell me all the reasons why they don't choose seafood, why they don't like seafood. I hear it all day long. So at Cornell, we're really trying to kind of counteract a lot of people's reasons why they don't choose seafood. I hear from people that um, they don't know what fish are local to the area. That's one reason that they wouldn't choose a local fish. So we have posters available, postcards with all the fish that are local to the area. People don't know where to find local seafood. So that's another thing that we've designed um, on our website. We have a seafood a local seafood locator with a list of fish markets that carry local seafood all across the island where people can find it. Um, people oftentimes say that it is very expensive, which that is, that is the case in a lot of different, uh, for a lot of different species of fish. I totally understand that, but we'll get to that next. Um, a lot of people say they don't like seafood, which if you haven't had it prepared well, that's, that's understandable a lot of times. People have a, a bad experience with it or have had a product that's like not very high quality. So in that case, yes, I can understand, but it's definitely worth giving it another try. And also people don't know how to cook seafood. So a lot of times they'll eat it at a restaurant, be open to that, but not knowing how to cook it at home. So here at Cornell, we've devised a whole bunch of different ways to overcome some of these hurdles and get people eating more seafood, especially on our website, localfish.org. We have a lot of answers to this. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about that local seafood um, can be expensive. A lot of different species of fish can be expensive. We get that. So for that reason, we're really trying to promote and focus on a lot of the underutilized, undiscovered, and less expensive seafood choices. There are a lot out there, including uh, porgies or scup, dogfish, skates, bluefish, sea robins, and monkfish, just to name a few. Um, these are definitely less expensive options. They may be a little on the harder side to find at some of the fish markets, but we hope people continue to ask because increasing uh, pressure on the markets will then hopefully have them decide that the customers want this product, let's start carrying it. So, but also the, the low demand means that these are plentiful, sustainable, and inexpensive. So we are trying to help create markets for a lot of these species of fish on Long Island. All right, so the benefits to choosing these underutilized fish is to create new markets for fishermen, because in a lot of cases, they're not receiving a, a decent amount of money for them. In some cases, there's no market for these fish. In say, the, um, the case of sea robin, there's no market. So these fish get thrown back and basically uh, wasted as, as bycatch in that case. Um, we like to try to get people to try new tastes and textures of different seafood because you might really decide that you love it. It's fabulous. Um, we're trying to increase the revenue for the fishermen, the fish markets, and the restaurants by drawing attention to some of these because seafood can be 
cost prohibitive in a lot of situations. So people wouldn't choose it on a menu when it's very expensive. And it is also helpful to take the pressure off more heavily fished fish, such as maybe the striped bass is, is a little expensive or a fluke or something like that. So it kind of, you know, you use something that's a little less familiar, takes the pressure off some of those other ones. This is on our website. This is our local seafood locator, localfish.org. This is a map of Long Island that has all of the fish markets and farmers markets. A lot of farmers markets now have seafood. There's a lot of seafood delivery businesses since COVID. So if you go to our website, you'll find a great fish market that will have local seafood. Okay, so now is the part where I kind of dive into the sustainable seafood, which is really important. Um, I know that that is important to a lot of customers as they try to purchase seafood. Um, there's a lot of media attention out there. There's some documentaries that focus on why fisheries are so bad. But um, I'm going to give you, hopefully, the, the correct information out there because U.S. fisheries are highly sustainable. Um, there are very, very strict regulations in place to make sure that our U.S. fisheries are sustainable. Um, in the most basic terms, sustainability is um, seafood that's caught at a rate that allows the population to continue to replenish. So whatever we take out is replenished um, in that ecosystem and there's, there's no problem. Uh, on a more scientific basis, fish and shellfish caught for human consumption by fishermen operating under fishery management systems that conserve fish stocks and the ecosystems that support them. Sustainable seafood. So is seafood harvested in the United States sustainable? Absolutely. Um, I know I get a lot of questions about the documentary Seaspiracy that talks about um, how, how fisheries are not sustainable, but they don't necessarily pertain to the United States in any way. So our fisheries are um, very sustainable. We are a global leader in sustainable seafood in the United States. We have, uh, our fisheries are conducted under science-based fishery management plans developed by fishery management councils. That's an open public process and uses the best scientific information available. Um, marine wild capture fisheries are enforced under 10 national standards of sustainability through the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, which exceeds the international standards for equal labeling of seafood. And by law, it's a law, that U.S. seafood must be caught according to fishery management plans. And these plans consider the social and economic outcomes for fisheries communities. They prevent overfishing. They help to rebuild depleted stocks, minimize bycatch and interaction with protected species, and identify and conserve essential habitat. So a lot of this is um, going into fisheries management, which is might be a little too much for this talk, but I just do want to stress it just because these laws are in place to ensure that our fisheries are sustainable in New York and in the United States. So the primary law that governs marine fisheries management in U.S. waters, in federal waters, is the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act. And the objectives of this act are to prevent overfishing, rebuild overfish stocks, increase long-term economic and social benefits, and ensure a safe, sustainable supply of seafood, which is all very important. So under the Magnuson-Stevens Act is an amendment, the Sustainable Fisheries Act of 1996. And that further strengthened the requirements to prevent overfishing and rebuild overfish fisheries, and set additional standards for fishery management plans to specify objective and measurable criteria for determining stock status and added new national standards to address vessel, vessel safety, fishing communities, and bycatch, and introduce fish habitat as a key component in fisheries management. Stock assessments are the scientific analysis of the abundance and composition of a fish stock. These stock assessments are really important to help fishery managers understand the effect of past fishing and also set the catch limits on an annual basis to prevent over, overfishing and encourage and support sustainable fisheries. And they do use the best available scientific information from surveys, landings, and models. 
And Cornell has been involved with uh, collecting some of this information that was used for stock assessments of certain fish. We did, uh, for, a, for a long time, we collected uh, the otoliths out of the fish, which are the ear bones and scales, which are used to age the fish. That, that information gets uh, included in the stock assessments of fish. And then NOAA Fisheries uses all of these results in the stock assessments to determine if a stock is overfished or might be subject to overfishing. And then when we're talking about fisheries, we're talking about these different stock status designations, which is, is, a fi is overfishing occurring on a fishery, which means that the annual rate of catch is too high. Is it overfished, which means the population size is too small, or is it rebuilt so that a previously overfished stock has increased to the target size? Um, all of these determinations and the results of the stock assessments are used to recommend the annual catch limits for each stock going forward. So there's a lot of science. There's a lot of, there's a lot of information that goes into all of these determinations to make sure that our fisheries are healthy um, and in good shape for the future. So at any point, if you were interested in knowing um, the stock status of most of the fish uh, in the US, um, this is available on NOAA Fisheries webpage. So most of our US fish stocks continue to improve. There's 92% of the stocks are not subject to overfishing, 80% are not overfished, and 47 stocks that are federally managed have been rebuilt since 2000, the year 2000. So if you look over here, in the light green, we have two stocks of fish um, that are on the overfished list, bluefish and Atlantic mackerel. So there's not too many in that region. So if you're interested in finding out the stock status of any fish that's, that you might think about, um, fishwatch.org, fishwatch.gov is a great website. So there's a lot of information on here about uh, the population and even nutrition and anything you wanted to know about any fish that you can input in this system. Uh, up to date info on the marine fish in US federal waters. Lots of information in this database. So. All right. So occasionally people will say, okay, that's a, there's an overfished fish that I would like to eat. Um, maybe it's bluefish, right? I really enjoy bluefish. Is that okay to eat or should I avoid it? Um, an overfish designation means that the stock is still managed to be able to increase. So it doesn't mean that that stock is going to be um, completely and totally wiped out. It just means that um, the, it's the stock size needs to be supported to uh, reach sustainable annual harvest. So it means that the trip limits for our fishermen will have to be lowered commercially and recreationally to allow that stock to rebuild. But know that that is in place to make sure that it does. And that approach is mandated by law so that um, overfished stocks are allowed to be allowed to rebuild, but also that they're still able to sustain the fishermen and the waterfronts and the jobs involved with seafood consumption. Um, okay, another thing I get questioned about all the time is what about fishing gear and the environment? So from my experience working on a lot of boats is that um, fishermen do want to conserve the fish that they cannot catch. They don't want to catch the extra fish uh, as bycatch and throw it back into the water because that's basically their, their next paycheck. So they do intend and, and make efforts to conserve fish whenever possible. Um, some fishing methods can accidentally catch other fish as bycatch or, or marine animals, but uh, there are a lot of protections and regulations in place to make sure that this does not happen. And this is also something that Cornell has been uh, very much involved in is uh, reducing bycatch of different fish and marine mammals in, in a lot of different ways. So we have come up with uh, a lot of different conservation gear technology devices to reduce bycatch of certain fish. We're working on a project right now. Uh, it's a, a pinger on a gill net that deters uh, marine mammals from going near that area. So that is an area of research that we are heavily involved in and making sure that fishing gear is uh, 
safer and more effective so that fishermen are catching the target catch and really not much more that they don't need to catch. Okay, so this is a funny picture that I found. Um, does this fish look fresh? <laughs> and really you should just look at that one picture first and then see that the googly eye has been removed from the second one. This is actually a, a picture that I found from a fish market in, I, I, it was overseas somewhere, I think I, I ran or something. I, I like to talk about this with people. What do you look for when purchasing fish to make sure that that fish is the fre as fresh as it could be? Um, you wanna make sure that the, the flesh is firm and shiny, the eyes are bright and clear and full, and they don't look cloudy or sunken, kind of like in the picture. You wanna make sure there's no dark brown or yellow discoloration around the edge of the filet and no dry edges and it doesn't have a very strong, bad, fishy, or ammonia smell. Uh, if the fish is frozen, uh, you wanna make sure it's free of ice crystals with no discoloration. It's solidly frozen in the package and not leaking any liquid, um, and no evidence of drying out, and no frost or ice particles inside the package. So, Local seafood does not have to travel as far to get to you to reach your plate, so hopefully you avoid some of these issues and the fish is fresher. Okay, so this is a funny video that I found that just kind of um, makes us think about how fe people feel um, the importance that they feel about local fish. So consumers want to know where their food came from and that that food meets high standards for safety, freshness, and sustainability. And on Long Island, our locavore movement is very strong. So I'm just going to play this video quick because I, I think it's really funny. Thank you for buying me that bag the other uh, day. Come on, it's more for me than you. God, you have beautiful eyes. Everyone tells me that. I'm the do. only one that told you that. No, I don't mean like in a flirty way, but people ask when I was a kid, like, you got great eyes. And it's like, I'm just a guy. You're my guy. I am your guy. Hey, guys. Hello. Hi, hello. My name is Dana. I'll be uh, taking care of you today. If you have any questions about the menu, please let me know. I guess I do have a question about the chicken. If you could just tell us a little bit more about it. Uh, the chicken is a heritage breed, uh, woodland raised chicken that's been fed a diet of sheep's milk, soy, and hazelnuts. Okay, this is, this is local? Yes, absolutely. Okay. I'm gonna ask you just one more time, and it's local? It is. Is that USDA organic, or Oregon organic, or Portland organic? It's just all across the board, organic. The hazelnuts, these are local? Uh, how big is the area where the chickens are able to roam free? I'm sorry to interrupt, I had exactly the same question. Four acres. Mm -hmm. Give me just a second, I'll be right back, okay? Okay. okay. This is nice. Right? You're doing the right thing. I'm too apologetic. You are. I, I drove way too slow here today, didn't I? Mm -hmm. I am so weird with that gas pedal, I think just moves the whole vehicle forward. Now. Oh, right. So here is the chicken you'll be oh, enjoying yeah. tonight. You have this information. This is fantastic. Absolutely. Uh, his name was Colin. Here are his papers, OK? That's great. He, he looks what? like a happy little yeah. guy who runs around. A lot of friends, other chickens as friends. Putting his little wing around another one and kind of like you know, palling around. I don't know that I can speak to that level of uh, intimate knowledge about him. Um, they do a lot to make sure that their chickens uh, uh, are very happy. When you say they, I mean, who are these people raising Colin? It's a farm that's located about uh, 30 miles south of Portland. And 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 you feel and you, am I, like you have a good relationship with this farm. We I do. Mean, but it's not some guy on a yacht who lives in Miami oh, who's goodness, just no. saying that he's organic. It just it tears at the core of my being the idea of someone just cashing in on a trend like organic. No, I know the type. No. Yeah. Um, tell you what, we're gonna go check it out if you don't mind. Just yeah. if you could hold our seats. Oh, yeah. No, no. Yeah, yeah. We'll, I won't be right back. We'll just want to make sure. It's just really clean off. Okay. Thank you so much, Dana. Sure, sure. So, uh, I just saw that skit, and it reminds me a lot of um, the importance that people place on making sure they know where their food came from, and um, you know why it's in, why it is important to know where your food came from. Cornell Cooperative Extension and our Choose Local Fish initiative has done a lot and provided a lot of opportunities for people to really get involved with local seafood on Long Island. 
So one of the ways that we did was hold a restaurant tasting events. So for that evening at, at different restaurants across Long Island, um, all of the fish on the menu or at the tasting event was all locally harvested. And these were really fun events. We had a bunch of different chefs that were very excited to get, ex get, to get involved with promoting all the local seafood on Long Island. And um, people were blown away really by the different tastes and textures and just how delicious um, skate and sea robin and, and these types of fish could be. So there was really um, a very enthusiastic audience and a lot of people's opinion changed about a lot of different seafood at these events on Long Island. So we're looking, um, so right now the grant that I had to do these restaurant events is uh, expired, but we're always looking for new funding to do these type of things. Another thing that we're doing right now is our Cook a Fish, Give a Fish project, which is a partnership with Eating with the Ecosystem based out of Rhode Island, and they're online seafood cooking classes. Uh, once in a while we're able to pull off doing an in-person event, so um, most of these chefs, or all of these chefs are very enthusiastic about including local seafood in, in, on their menus and they showed the home chef how to do it. And for the ticket price of $35, um, you can join the class or attend the event and 100% of that ticket price is used to purchase local seafood for the community in need. And on Long Island, we have been doing that at the Shinnecock Res Reservation and we've provided over 6,000 meals to the the community there, which is fabulous. And we do have an event coming up this Tuesday night. It's in Riverhead at East End Food Market. And we'll have East End Food Institute's resident chef, Jay Lippin. He's going to show everybody how to cook monkfish tacos. So if anyone is interested in attending that event, um, I would definitely suggest you know buying tickets as soon as you can. But it's a really fun night. There is a wine pairing to go along with that and the tasting of the food. So. That's been an incredibly successful project and a lot of fun as people learn to cook the local seafood in their own home or taste it in the in-person events. Um, on our website, localfish.org, we do have a series of recipes and cooking demonstration videos that we came out with during COVID. Since people were not able to go out to restaurants or and stuck home and looking for thing, different things to do, we encourage them to try to purchase some local seafood and learn how to cook it at home. And these were created by a culinary nutritionist out of Montauk, her name is Stephanie Sachs. So they are, they're for the most part, very healthy, very easy, um, very realistic, I like to say, not a thousand ingredients. So we have all these recipes up here and the videos are online if you guys wanna learn how to make some different seafood recipes. So on our website, I think we went over a lot of it, but check it out, localfish.org, where we have the seafood retailer locator, the cooking demo videos, information about our tasting events and other outreach and education. And we also have our social media pages where we uh, outreach, do a lot of outreach and education about different events. So if you guys like us and follow us on social media, that would be great. And overall, the things that you can do to help encourage healthy fisheries, uh, shop local, like we talked about, get to know your fishermen or your seafood retailer. Uh, on the North Fork here, we have South Old Fish Market, uh, Braun Seafood, North Fork Seafood, um, Riverhead, we have Little Fish Shop, we have a, a whole bunch of great, uh, we have Alice's Fish Market in Greenport. There's a lot of great fish markets that deal directly with the fishermen and can tell you where your fish came from. So get to know them, ask questions, ask where your fish came from, uh, and they will tell you. So purchasing from a reputable fish purveyor will allow you to find out exactly where your fish came from. And other things that you can do as a, as a good citizen is just help keep Long Island's waterways healthy and clean, minimize the amount of fertilizers that go into the water, um, minimize your, your overall use of fertilizers so that they don't wash into the water, and then keep litter from entering storm drains. And if you can help us out by completing uh, one of our surveys that we have up here right now, we have, we have a scanning, scannable QR code for our general seafood consumption survey, and then we have one 
other survey that uh, we could that we would really appreciate some input as far as um, your feelings about new seafoods and in particular uh, monkfish. We're doing a monkfish marketing program, so if you can just take a few seconds to give us a little info about if you ever have tried monkfish or have any experience with that, we would love it. So behind me over here or in front of me over here is our fisheries team at Cornell, and they could help answer any questions and help do surveys with you if you don't mind just taking like two seconds to do that. So that is really it. Um, as you can see, monkfish here. So thank you guys. Uh, it's, been, it's been great to be here. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about seafood. <laughs>